So I'm currently a freshman in college, and as you can imagine, everyone I know is going out, having fun, making new, possibly lifelong friends. Well, everyone except for me. My mom keeps saying, you have to enjoy the college life. And I'm like, I am, mama. I like to spend my time watching TV, listening to music, taking walks, basically anything that doesn't involve socializing. Because that's my version of fun, and that's OK. My name is Isha, and I'm a loner. And today I'm going to talk to you about why that's not such a bad thing. So first, I'd like to define what being alone actually means. It's not about abandoning or disconnecting from everyone. It's about giving yourself the opportunity to focus all your energy on yourself without having to worry about others and their perceptions of you. And it's facilitated by being physically alone. As an introvert, I need my me time every day. And I'm sure many of you can relate. Most of us, as members of the human species beyond our individual personalities, are constantly aware of the people surrounding us. And we even manipulate our own behavior based on what we perceive others' expectations to be. This is ingrained in our evolutionary and biological nature. Humans and some other organisms, like macaques and songbirds, have neural cells called mirror neurons. Basically, when we watch somebody else perform a behavior, the same neurons associated with performing that behavior light up in our own brains. We can literally think and feel what someone around us is thinking and feeling. Evolutionarily, humans have had to fit into social groups to increase our chances of survival. We're predisposed to mimicking others to fit in, but now, when that evolutionary survival instinct is no longer needed, we still tend to alter our own behavior according to those around us, and we lose our true selves in the process. Being alone can help us find ourselves after years of being someone we're not. Instead of using our energy to read and mimic others, we can focus it on ourselves. We can listen to our own inner voice, recognize our own vibration, and be present with it. Let me give you an example. In high school, I had to spend two hours each day just to get to and from school on the bus. And although this may seem like an incredible inconvenience for a busy student at a highly competitive high school, it was actually my favorite time of the day. I would sit deep in the secluded, long gray seat, put on my noise-canceling headphones, rest my head against the window and take a deep breath, <sighs> releasing the burdensome energy I felt while around most others. And as the calming instrumental music flowed strongly from my headphones into my ears, I would listen to the voice in my head that I usually ignored. And it's beautiful comments about the bright green trees passing by, or the sound of the rain pattering against the window, or the feel of the sun's warmth on my skin. I would hear its motivational words as they replaced the anxious thoughts imprinted on me by my peers about tomorrow's test. And I would hear its sarcastic sense of humor as I pondered whether anyone is truly mentally stable. In being mentally alone for those two hours each day, I recognized my curiosity and appreciation for the world, my confidence, and my lightheartedness. And I began to identify that burdensome energy I felt while around most others as the false persona of the timid, socially awkward little girl I was morphed into. Essentially, I started to discover my true self. When the pandemic omitted the need for a bus ride as school transitioned into an online format, I lost the previously established time I had to listen to myself. But my daily solitude practice had become so influential in my life, I had to find a way to preserve its effects, but reformat its time and place. So I've determined three simple steps for effective practice of solitude. Number one, find a time and place where you can be physically alone and undisturbed for some time. 
I like to go outside and connect with nature. Number two, you can even choose to do something during that time as long as it's a relatively mindless activity like riding the bus, taking a shower, drinking tea, or even consciously doing nothing. Number three, just try to listen to your thoughts. There's no need to control or analyze them, just notice them and watch them pass. This simple practice can help us find who we are. We briefly disconnect from the worries of others' opinions and the absorption of their energies and thoughts. And we give ourselves the opportunity to be present without having to analyze anything. We just be. And in that being, that is where the true self lies, the self unadulterated by the expectations, perceptions, and judgments of others and ourselves. There's no need to verbalize who we find because oftentimes it's not even possible. We just feel it, recognize it, be with it. Studies have shown that this practice of just being, which is an important part of meditation, significantly reduces stress and increases focus. It's also home to what Jack Fong, a sociologist at the California State Polytechnic University calls existentializing moments or fleeting realizations of clarity about ourselves and our presence within society that arise from inward focused solitude. I like to extend this and say that practicing solitude allows us to recognize our presence within time we not only divert our consciousness to ourselves, but also to our presence within the present moment, which really is the only time and place we truly know. For example, as widely known, the transition to college is a complex experience imbued by journeys of newfound independence. And I've been fortunate enough to embark on that journey over the past several months. One day, I was walking to the library and I did something that would have been very difficult in my previous conveyor belt lifestyle or my school home, school home daily pattern where every day I saw the same people in the same places at the same times. I stopped and I looked around and I thought to myself, wow, I'm walking to the library. And in that moment, it felt quite amazing because, well, I've never been able to walk to the library before but if I was in an environment surrounded by people I had to interact with, I might not have been able to appreciate where I was in that present moment. I might not have noticed the cars whooshing by or the dancing trees or even the sensation of walking. Instead, I might have been worrying about how I looked to others or what they might have been thinking of me. To me, this is the true value of solitude. We're now able to discover the esoteric beauties within ourselves and within the small moments that we can now capture. Things as simple as the sound of the trees or the smell of the air. And we begin to cultivate a love and appreciation for our existence and the gift of life because we fully experience and revel in every beautiful aspect of every moment. This mindset isn't confined to the temporary period of solitude. As you continue to practice living with your true self in the present moment when alone, you may find your entire perception of the internal and external world start to change. In social interactions, we can still maintain the clarity and integrity of our true energies to be ourselves around others and maintain and be in the present moment physically mentally, and spiritually. This can actually enhance our positive relationships as we intimately listen to and appreciate every facet of one another and fully experience these social moments. So, I encourage you to spend some time each day in solitude. You might be surprised at the beautiful features of life you find within and without. And like my mom says, enjoy life. Thank you.